Hello and welcome to our online service for Sunday the 3rd of October 2021. Now we're in October, I wonder, have you been tempted to put your Christmas tree up yet? Have you done it? Are you thinking about it? Are your fingers itching? Please don't. Not until after Remembrance Sunday. It's up to you, of course. But at the beginning of our service today, uh, we just want to come with a song of confidence in God. So no matter what kind of week we've had, whether it's been high or whether it's been low, we, we know that we come to our God who is above the circumstance. It's always about his strength. It's always about his power in our lives, not the things outside of that that can affect us so much. So this beautiful song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Voice. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus' name.
So Heavenly Father, we come into your presence confident in Christ our cornerstone, confident in God our Saviour, confident in your power to work through our lives. And we pray, Lord, as we go through the rest of this service, that confidence will grow in you. And we will grow in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to play you a little animated video right now that I stumbled across this week. Uh, I, I don't know, but maybe somebody who is watching our video needs to see this video. And as a way of touching your own heart, it's, it's called The Broken Heart, and it, it may just register with you. It's an animation, it's very simple, but I think it's quite good. I might find you in here. Yep. You're still working on that heart thing. Yeah, it's for Dad. It's a tribute for Dad. Honey, it's not going to bring him back. He's at peace now. In the Bible it says oh, that... Don't give me that Bible rubbish. It also says in the Bible, yeah, that it's better to sit on the roof than to put up with a nagging wife. Mitchell, you're not listening to me, are you? Every time I try to say... Daddy's love heart. No, it's a bottom and it is very special. So we have to be very careful. Oh, I got it. Give it back to me. Yuck, Lillian, you left dirty marks. Let me give the bottom a wipe and we can pretend nothing happened. <laughs> Whoops. What happened? I love you, Daddy. Your hair looks nice today, Daddy. I can repair your shattered heart. Not bad for a carpenter, hey? Fantastic. We all have broken hearts at times, don't we? We all have broken dreams. And it's just lovely to know that God wants to put that right in us. Do you feel the world is 
beautiful, isn't it? So we're going to come to the reading of the Word of God now. This is from another one of the Apostle Paul's epistles. We looked at Romans 5 last week. This is 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23, down to chapter 11, verse 1. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising 
questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something that I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not call someone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks or the Church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. There is a wonderful verse in the Bible, not one that I've just read there, but at the start of Hebrews 12, that I guess is close to the hearts of many Christians. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. I was thinking about this week in the context of my mother-in-law's funeral last Wednesday. A woman who has indeed run her race with perseverance. It didn't take much for me to link that to last week's production line message from Romans 5, 1 to 5, where God uses our suffering to produce perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. My mind then turned to what happens Next, when suffering has produced perseverance, when perseverance has produced character, and when character has produced hope, what comes after that? In short, I concluded that it gives us the responsibility to pass that hope on to others. How else does the work of God's grace in our lives pass on to the next generation or to other people in general who are around us if we are not examples of that grace to them? We read some wonderful verses there in 1 Corinthians 10 and one verse in chapter 11, of course, uh, but that just shows that Stephen Langton got it wrong on this occasion. Who's Stephen Langton, I hear you say? He was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century and he has two claims to fame. Firstly, he was the man who divided our Bible into chapters but not into verses. And we still use his demarcations today. But he was also involved in the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. So he was a man of quite some influence, as you can imagine. Now, back to the Apostle Paul and what he wrote in that spare verse, the one that appears in chapter 11. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I'm going to encourage us to be an example as the Apostle was because we too have a responsibility to others if we are already believers. The trickiest part of being an example is that we are human and as such we have our limitations which we all know only too well. We see many people who get set up either deliberately or accidentally as role models only to discover that they have feet of clay and aren't as strong as we hope they might be. And that is a cross-sphere phenomenon. We could all point to celebrities or politicians and perhaps even church leaders, most definitely church leaders, who have fallen short of being such good examples, in some cases disastrously so. But you see, I love that in this passage, the Apostle Paul, who probably more than anybody had the right to set himself up as a be-all and end-all example, didn't do that and other people would do well to take note of Paul's humility here you see the ultimate example is Christ and our task is to follow him so that we can be conduits of his values and his teaching and his power and all the things that we know of from him 
Paul is putting himself up as an example because his primary ministry is that of a servant as ours is. In Romans chapter 1 verse 1 he says this, Paul a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. This is servant as in bond slave, one who has voluntarily submitted his or her will to the will of his or her master out of loyalty rather than coercion. Example here is a beautiful word as well. It means to mimic or even mime our master. So this was no vain boast for the Apostle Paul. He was not expressing an undue confidence in his own abilities or ministry. His confidence was in the work of God through him. That he was a conduit of God's grace and not the generator of his own importance or ego, which is often where people fall short. And that should be our goal too. It should be the goal of every believer, especially those in ministry positions, to be conduits of God, not based on our own self-importance. People will follow us as we follow Christ because he is attractive. The Bible got the hang of this following idea uh, 2,000 years before Twitter ever got hold of the idea. It is part of our higher calling in God. Galatians 2 verse 20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that seems pretty deep doesn't it? But it has a very practical outworking. In the preceding verses of our reading uh, the Apostle had gone into what was clearly a moral dilemma facing the church at Corinth and it typifies many of the internal thoughts that we have in our hearts. In verse 23, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Paul is returning to a theme that he also developed in 1 Corinthians 6, his words suggest that to be able to lead by example, three things need to be taken into account. Legality, expediency and edification. Paul is talking, as he often did, about the Mosaic law. He speaks of the right of the Christian to be utterly free from the influence and entrapment of not just worldly thought, but of any thought that is not of Christ. Philippians 2.5 tells us that we are to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, which is an important aspect for us to carry in our minds at all times. The same mindset as Jesus Christ. In short, the Apostle is pointing out that, using the example of food, we are not bound by what the law had called impure. Now that Jesus sacrificed, had replaced the annual sin offering. Now we have to be careful here. There are things that it is just plain wrong to do. And be honest, the commandments haven't changed, even though their purpose may well have done. They had been a condemning and trapping force, but with grace in the mix, they changed from condemning to constraining, from entrapping to empowering, a concept that the religious leaders of the time that Jesus was ministering on earth failed to grasp. Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman there in John chapter 4. He wasn't supposed to do that under the law. In the same way that he forgave sins, he healed on the Sabbath, he made friends of sinners and prostitutes. None of those things were supposed to be what he would have done under the clauses of the law as it was interpreted then. And remember, Jesus never said that he came to get rid of the law. He always came, said that he came to fulfil it instead. So Christians still have guidelines to adhere to. The moral code has not changed. If it was biblically wrong then, it is still biblically wrong now. But mercy in the mix makes the rules become our tools instead. Paul told Timothy... 
that the law is good if one uses it properly. By following the example of Christ in living righteously and not causing anyone to stumble, as Paul put it in our reading there, exchanging judgment for grace, we prove God's word is and can be a positive force in our lives and other people's too. In expedience, the place at which the law stops being helpful is when it gets in the way of someone enjoying the fruits of grace. Remember the conversation that there is in scripture between Jesus and the Canaanite woman with the sick daughter, Matthew 15. In verse 26, Jesus says, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Verse 27, the woman says, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In verse 28, Jesus, I just imagine with a smile on his face, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. I love the audacity of that woman. Under the law, Jesus was right. But by grace and because of her great faith, he claimed a higher position than the law. To do so was expedient, profitable and beneficial for her. That is the quality of grace. As Christians, we are the recipients of grace. As an example to others, we are the providers and demonstrators of grace. As we read back there in 1 Corinthians 10 in verses 27 and 28, with a generosity of heart from which others benefit. In terms of edification, the caution of the apostle to the Corinthians was that not everything is constructive. Get that. Not everything is constructive. Probably the main responsibility we have as examples is to be builders up of people just as Jesus was builders up of his disciples and other people through his ministry on earth. So if you find yourself in an is it right or is it wrong situation, ask yourself three things. Is it biblical? Does this build someone up? And is God glorified through it? If the answer to any of those is no, then it's no. If the answer to all of those is yes, then it's yes. This principle of true Christian freedom is simple. It's expressed there in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 10. I have the right to do anything. But the principle of true Christian freedom is not without its restrictions. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. We are tied by that rule. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Our rights, in a sense, are limited by what is beneficial to other people. We should never forget that. It should always be in our mind. Only by mimicking or miming Christ, ensuring that we adopt the role of the bond servant who has submitted entirely to the will of the master, will we get that right. Otherwise, we'll put ourselves first. That submission, contrary to human logic, makes us complete. Although we know it isn't easy, which is why we have that great crowd of witnesses that we referenced before from Hebrews urging us on in the faith race. We are not called to be an example because we are perfect, but because the one to whom we are a bondservant is perfect. And it is him that we point ourselves and the unbelievers that we know to in worship. It is him to whom we guide people to find their salvation because salvation is found in no one else. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord God, that as we contemplate your word, it doesn't matter how weakly it's preached, it matters how strongly it's received. And I pray, Father God, that the strength of your word will penetrate into our hearts and our minds and we will become the examples in you 
that lead people closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we, we close our service as we started with a great song of confidence in God, regardless of the circumstances. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk. great to be with you again today to minister to you and I hope you'll join us again in another seven days time in the meantime the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you in his own name Amen <laughs>